and welcome to Colbus Corner. Today we will be at Birds of Prey and we will be talking about the different kinds of birds of prey and how they catch and feed and that's actually one we're going to be talking about. So stay tuned because Colby's Corner starts now. here with Mr. Steven and we are at the center for birds of prey. Can you tell us what, uh, like some of the birds that y'all have here? Sure, well we work with birds of prey so usually when people say bird of prey they're talking about hawks and eagles, owls, falcons, vultures, vultures. Um, osprey or some of the uh, other birds that we treat and kites that's the last group of raptors. They all grab their food with their feet except for the vultures. Uh, and we have a, have a variety of different birds. Uh, some are injured birds that we are treating in our hospital, trying to take care of them and get them back out into the wild if we can. And others are birds that we use to teach with that are in captivity for their life to help us teach you and others a little bit more about them and why they're important. So um, can you like take us to some birds and show us some? Sure. Well, we can bring one over if, if you want. We have here a, a peregrine falcon, which is uh, the fastest animal on the planet, and this is a, a bird-eating bird of prey. You can see right now she's eating a day-old chicken, but um, they all eat other animals. They might be mammals, they might be birds, they might be snakes or fish, but for the peregrine falcon, nothing but other birds in her diet. In the wild, it would be quail and pigeons and doves and duck. Um, this bird travels at speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour when she's chasing after her prey, so incredibly fast. Wow. And you can see those feet with the claws on the end for grabbing on and uh, and holding on. Yeah, he can definitely feel that. Yeah. She's like, I'm gonna throw feathers at you. So at this point, uh, a feather is not worth anything to her. She, if she eats a feather, it's not gonna give her any energy. Uh, she can eat them and she does eat a lot of them, but you can see she's plucking off some so that she doesn't waste that valuable space in her crop with things that won't give her any value. This is a bird that uh, was bred specifically to be an educational bird. He's been uh, teaching people here at the center his entire life. He's six years old now. Again, just like the falcon, you see those powerful feet. Uh, Harris hawks and peregrine falcons are both uh, really good examples of how birds can be indicators of what's happening in the environment. Uh, the peregrine falcon told us about DDT, which was a pesticide, and it caused all kinds of problems for them. Harris hawks live in the southwestern deserts in the U.S., so in Texas and Arizona and New Mexico, and uh, the problems that they face are largely related to people moving into their territory. They have a lot of issues with electrocution and other things that uh, are a result of the fact that we live where they used to be the only ones living there. And this particular area is called the owl wood, and we've got actually 16 different species of owls that are on display from all over the world, including the spectacled owl here, which is native to South America. Uh, next door is the great horned owl, which is found right here in South Carolina. So uh, birds not only from our backyard, but from other parts of the world as well. So you can see some of the similarity to the great horned owl that we saw, right? It has those feather tufts on the top of the head. It's got big, light-colored eyes. Eagle owls are usually just the large owls. And here in North America, our eagle owl is the great horned owl. Again, this is the Eurasian eagle owl, native to Europe and Asia. This is a bird that was bred here at the center to be an educator. She's now two years old, and uh, she may live to be as old as uh, 35 or 40 years old. Um, you got a good close fly by there. Did you hear any noise when she was coming? No. Really. No. The best part. How about watch the center post here, Colby? And uh, the owl will come. Don't watch the owl. Watch the post. You know she's coming here, right? Let's see if we know when she's coming. <laughs> you heard her make noise with her mouth, right? But uh -huh. even though uh, she is Wait, quite, she quite right noisy with her now. mouth, she's very quiet with her wings. Being nocturnal, that's one of the biggest challenges is how do you sneak up on your, on your prey without making any noise? And owls are fantastic, uh, fantastically quiet flyers. So this is a bird that was injured and came into our medical facility and couldn't be released again because of its injuries. Um, the bird has some spinal problems, can't bend very well, uh, and so would have an issue eating if it were able to hunt. And um, so 
when we decide a bird can't be released into the wild, in some cases we can utilize them like this to teach with. Some of the other birds, the eagle owl that we saw just a minute ago was a bird that was bred specifically to do this job. Why do birds fly so low to the ground? Well, what she was doing there was she was using gravity. So some birds fly low to the ground because they're listening for their prey. That would be the owl that we saw a minute ago. Other birds fly low to the ground because when you jump off of something, gravity pulls you down towards the earth and starts giving you some momentum. Uh, and she was just using gravity to gain some speed. You have to either get your momentum from work, so you're pumping your wings and flapping, or you've got to figure out some other way. Either you can soar on hot air that's rising, or you can glide with gravity. Okay, so the last bird we're going to look at is a kite. Kites are another group of raptors, or birds of prey. They're found all over the world. This particular one we're going to see is native to Africa. It's called a yellow-billed kite. But here in South Carolina, we have two, the Mississippi kite and the swallow-tailed kite, which is actually an endangered species. They're interesting because what kites do is they catch their food and their feet, and then they eat it while they're flying. So unlike all the rest that we've seen who would stop to eat, the kites are actually carrying insects in the air and biting them apart and swallowing them while they're flying. The things you're going to notice about him as he flies is he looks a little bit like a kite. So when you think about your toy kite at the beach, it kind of hangs in the wind. And if you watch him, he sort of hangs there in the wind. He has a very long tail, and that tail gives him the maneuverability that he needs to be able to catch insects. And what Jen is going to be doing is tossing little bits of food up to the kite, and he'll catch them in his feet and then swallow them. I mentioned the swallow-tailed kite, which is found here in South Carolina. It looks a lot like this bird, uh, other than the fact that instead of being gray like the yellow-billed kite, the swallow-tailed kite is black and white, very striking it look in like appearance. It's doesn't look like he's eating. No, he's putting it, you're missing it all because you're th throw some bits when he's coming this way so that we can see him. He's catching, going away every time. So watch this time. Jen will throw a bit up there. He's going to catch it in his feet and then he put it in his mouth right oh, there as he was going above us. So if it was a dragonfly, he'd be catching it and picking it apart and spitting out the parts he didn't want and then, um, and then eating the ones that he did. The swallow-tailed kite, again, like this, but black and white with a long forked tail, which is very easy to see and identify. Uh, and we actually ask that if you see one, you report it to us here at the center because they're endangered and we're trying to identify the places where they're living so that we can protect those habitats that the, the kites need to survive in the state. They also eat things like snakes and frogs they grab out of the tops of trees. So Jen has a piece of food on her finger. And if you watch closely, she grabs, the kite grabs it right off of her finger. Apparently missed that one. We'll try that again. So what Jen is going to do is put her hand up in the air. She's going to act like a tree. And on the tip of her finger is a piece of food. That's supposed to be the snake. Watch what happens here. Flew through, grabbed the snake, ate it as he was flying, kept on moving. So when are you open? Well, um, the Center for Birds of Prey is open Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays for visitors from the public. We're open from 10 to 5. We have two tours, one that starts at 10.30 and one that starts at 2 o'clock, and two flying demonstrations, one at uh, 11.30 and one at 3 o'clock. So you can come any of those days. Well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. It was nice having you out here. Oh, hey, how are you guys doing? Peter Pete here. Hey, you know, I just pulled this out and I'm kind of just dusting it off. I'm not painting it, but I'm dusting it off, but I use my brushes for a lot more than just painting. You know, that was really cool that Colby got to go out there to see the birds of prey. You know, that was really neat how that eagle, ah, seeing that thing fly, that was beautiful. You know, you're probably wondering, okay, you just saw the birds, why do I have a telescope out? Well, it kind of ties into our scripture today, and it's found in Psalms 8, verse 3 through 8. And it says, oh, wait, hold on, where's my other brush? I'm not going to use this one because this one's for dusted. So, oh, here it is. Found it this week. All right, so here's what it says. It says, I look at the heavens you made with your hands. I see the moon and the stars you created. And I wonder, why are people so important to you? Why do you even think about them? Why do you even care so much about humans? Why do you even notice them? But you made them almost like gods and crowned them with glory and honor. You put them in charge of everything you made. You put everything under their control. People rule over the sheep and cattle and all the wild animals. They rule over the birds in the sky and the fish that swim in the sea. All right, so you see, the telescope ties into that scripture by right at the beginning when it says, I can see the stars and the moon. You know, then it also talks about how 
God has put us over all the fish and the birds in the sky. So that's where it ties in with the birds in the air. That eagle, the kite, the owl, all that. God has put us over all of that, which I think is really cool. Now, the other reason why I got my telescope here is because Colby is now going up to the observatory in Columbia, South Carolina, and he's going to get to see some really cool stuff. So I'm going to keep dusting off my telescope here and get ready to go out later. So now we're here at Melton Observatory, and I'm here with Mr. Mallory. What is your job here? Uh, I'm an instructor. I teach astronomy to students as well as public. What kind of things do you look at through your telescope? Uh, well, we can look at all sorts of things. During the day, we can look at the sun, which is what I have this telescope set up here looking at. Um, and at night, we can look at things, anything from planets to the moon to stars to nebula to galaxies. So can we see the sun? You can. Now? Yeah. Oh, it's orange. It is orange. And everything else is like black around it. It's cool. The sun's orange because that tells you um, tells us what the temperature of the sun is. Um, cooler stars are more red in color, hotter stars are more blue in color. So our sun's a fairly cool star, being orange. Can you see the black spots on the surface? Yeah, on the sun. Like yeah, those, those are sunspots. And what is a um like what is a flare? A flare? Um, a flare is basically um, a buildup of magnetic energy that suddenly releases. Um, and causes more or less an explosion on the surface of the sun. Well, can it, that flare, can it come to the Earth, like hit it's the Earth? It's possible, um, it's, and it's happened before. So how long does it take that energy or radiation from the sun flare to get to the Earth? Um, it depends on how fast um, the particles leave the sun. It can take anywhere from several hours to a few days. Wow. So what makes this telescope different from all the others? Uh, well, as you see, we have two telescopes here. Uh, this bottom one, the bigger one, is actually just a standard um, astronomical telescope. It's, it's really built for seeing things at nighttime. But what we can do is we can put this very powerful filter, which almost looks like a mirror, um, in front of the telescope, and it blocks 99.9999% of the light coming from the sun. So you can think of it like a big pair of sunglasses for a telescope. So basically, if we looked through it and looked at the sun, we would see just like we saw through the telescope? Correct. Huh. Only that, not magnified. Oh, and that's the um, filter that this you put on filter. there? This is correct. And so what, is the, what does the telescope on top do? Okay. Well, the telescope on top is a special telescope meant for just looking at the sun. Um, the sun is comprised of about three quarters hydrogen gas. So all the light energy that we see from the sun is from hydrogen gas that gets burned um, and fuses into helium. Um, now when hydrogen burns, it releases light at certain wavelengths. This telescope is built to only see light from those wavelengths. So if you think of the whole visible spectrum, this telescope only sees about one six hundredth of that amount of light. So if we put if we put this aiming at the sun, we would see like flares and stuff? You would. Cool. Can we see one? Yes. There's like little like things hanging off of the sun. Are those the flares? Those are. Cool. A more general term for it is a prominence, which is basically just a cloud of plasma that rises from the surface of the sun. And there's like a little line in it. I guess. That. The dark lines? Yes. Yeah, those are filaments, um, also known as prominences. Um, they're actually coming up off of the surface of the sun towards you. Um, they appear darker just because they're cooler in temperature compared to the surface of the sun itself. If you were to see them on the edge of the sun, you would see them coming out just like you, you see with the other ones. So can you look at the sun with just any regular telescope? Um, no. That, and doing that would very much damage your eye. Um, the only way to look at the sun through a telescope is using proper filtration, which is what we used earlier. Um, so, in order to demonstrate what would happen without a, uh, without a filter on the telescope, I'll pull this piece of newspaper up there and, and let you see what happens. And you took the lens off? So I took the filter off, it's sitting over here on the side. So if I hold this piece of newspaper up, we can see the sun's light coming through the, through the telescope here. As I focus that light... It's getting like the yellow. It's going to heat up. You can see it starting to smoke now. And that's just the sun? And that's just the that? light from the sun. So imagine, imagine that's your eye. Wow. That's what would happen if you were to look through a telescope without the special filtration. Wow. 
So kids, don't ever look at your telescope at the sun with the, without the proper filter, because you don't want to end up like that newspaper. So I noticed you got a big and a small eyepiece, but what is the difference between them? Um, well, the different eyepieces allow me to use different magnifications. With this bigger eyepiece, um, I get a wider field of view and a smaller magnification. So if I'm looking at a larger object, say the sun or the moon, I can see the whole thing within the field of view. If I use a smaller eyepiece, I get more magnification, and it only lets me see a smaller portion, but I get to see it a lot closer up. So if we're looking at the moon, I can see the whole moon in this eyepiece, but I can see a nice close-up view of a crater with this eyepiece. What are we going to look at Venus with? We're going to look at Venus with a smaller eyepiece. So we can see the surface of it, or not just the outside? Um, well, Venus, we can't see the surface of Venus because it's completely covered in clouds. Um, and right now, Venus is very close to the sun. So because Venus orbits closer to the sun than the Earth does, it goes through phases just like our moon does. So with Venus being very close to the sun, we're going to see it as a very thin crescent shape. So it'll almost look like a very thin crescent moon. It'll just be a lot smaller. So what would you recommend for a kid my age to start, like, looking at the moon in astronomy, I guess you call it? Yeah. Um, well, if you're really interested in astronomy, the best thing that you can do is try to get a telescope. Right? When I was 10 years old, I got my first telescope, and when I saw the rings of Saturn, it basically got me hooked for life. Um, so if you're interested in astronomy as a hobby, um, definitely look at getting in, getting a telescope. Um, uh, and read all the books you can. There are literally thousands of books out there to teach you about astronomy. Um, and if you're curious about astronomy as a career in the future, like if you want to be an astronomer um, for your job when you grow up, um, really study math and science. Those, those are going to be really important. Well, thank you for letting us come out here today. You're welcome. Cypress Gardens and I'm here with Mr. David. Can you tell us some about the, the uh, butterflies? We have, um, most of our butterflies come from out of state. So we, we buy, <laughs> buy the chrysalis, we buy the chrysalis form of the butterfly, you know, it comes in stages. And we buy those from farms in Florida and uh, Alabama, some from Texas. And we buy the chrysalis, they ship it FedEx overnight and then we pin them. I can show you in the box over here. We, we pin them in the box in here. And they arrive. Each, each chrysalis usually butterflies. Caterpillar uses a silk gland to attach to a, a leaf or a twig. And then when they ship the uh, chrysalis here, I pin them either through the twig or through the silk and put them in there. And they'll emerge in probably about seven or eight days they're going to come out and then they're going to warm up and get their wings, lengthen in here and warm up their body temperature. And when I see that they're ready to come out, I open the doors and that's how we populate the butterfly house with our butterflies. And we also have uh, kind of a nursery over here where we raise them. If you'd like to look here, we can show you the life cycle. Now once the butterflies emerge, they're gonna start eating and mating and the females are going to start laying eggs. So we have, we have plants here, certain plants that they're going to lay eggs on. And you can see at the end of the plant here, the little yellow dots. Mm -hmm. These are butterfly eggs that the females lay. So those will hatch in the Caterpillars, they hatch the in the caterpillars. Yeah. The main thing is they put them on the little, because when we were born, we couldn't eat a big steak and baked potato meal. So they can't eat these heavy leaves, so you see that she lays her eggs on these little tender ends, so when the little caterpillar comes out, he can eat baby food. Then he's going to start growing, turning into a caterpillar, and start eating, and eating for about two weeks. He's going to just solid eat. So what kind of butterfly would that turn into? This will turn into the zebra, this black and yellow butterfly, this kind of a brown looking caterpillar. Oh, I didn't even see him. 
Yeah, he's gonna turn into a Julia, an orange long wing. And yeah. then they're going to, in about two weeks, they're going to turn into a Christmas. See there, how gold it is? There's a butterfly in that right now. Yeah, there's a butterfly in there right now, changing from the caterpillar into a bunny. See the female laying her egg? See how she curls her abdomen? I actually, see oh, the one cool. egg? See the one egg? Yeah. So in about two weeks, they're going to change from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Then they're going to emerge out of that, like in the Christmas box. And their wings are going to lengthen warm up and then they're going to fly away so we can raise a few in here now over here you can see you can see this would be a black solitaire this is a different plant so not every butterfly is going to lay on the same plant now they're going to nectar they're going to feed on all these pretty flowers that we grow in here so i have to make sure that i have plants in here that they're going to enjoy eating so i see you all have like a good variety of like chicks and ducks yeah we uh we uh, got these little Chinese painted quail, they're also called button quail. They're from Asia. And I, I got, uh, I started with 10, I thought it'd be a cute little, little, uh, they're little ground scavengers. They eat off of the ground and they don't eat butterflies or uh, anything to do with butterflies. Is this a chick? It's a little chick, yeah. They'll lay eggs. Uh, I started with 10, I got up to close to 50. So now I've, I, I trapped some and gave them away, and then I'm down to about 25 again. So now we're over here at the Swamp Aerial, and I'm here with Miss Melanie. Miss Melanie, what is this fish, and what is all the animals in this exhibit? Like, what are they called? Well, right here we have the channel catfish, and um, also a soft-shell turtle. Where's he that? at? He is under this log over here, hiding. Huh. He's, he's got his little, his nose he's up. got a snorkel for a nose. He's sticking up through the log there. So what did you say that was? Uh, this is a two-toed amphima. It's a type of aquatic salamander. And, and you, I'm guessing and you also the have same. the siren. It has external gills on the side of its head, and it's also a salamander. So what is in this tank? Uh, we have a long-nosed gar and two common carp in this tank. Where's the long-nosed gar at? Uh, you'll see it in this corner over here. Oh, there he is. And this is a what you said? A common carp. Huh. The gar feeds on these smaller fish you'll see swimming around. And on this wall, we'll have all native snakes from around this area in the swamp. Uh, this is the cotton mouse. It's a venomous snake. Both those are cotton mouse? Yes. There's two in there. Wow. Mm -hmm. And like, how big can the cotton mouth get? Uh, about five to six feet. Wow. Yeah. And what's in here? Uh, this is the copperhead. A lot of people, oh. this is venomous also. Uh, people will make mistake in the corn snake and the copperhead. Quite often, the corn snakes not venomous, of yeah, course. I've held a corn yeah. snake. Before. Okay, yeah. Um, but this one, you gotta watch out for. And in um, here? That is a little pygmy rattlesnake. These don't get very big. Is he poisonous? Yes, this is venomous. There's actually a difference between venomous and poisonous. Um, oh. Venomous, uh, the pit vipers, you can absorb it when they bite you, absorb it into your bloodstream. And then poisonous is usually if you, is something that if you eat it, it will make you sick. So uh, we call these venomous. And what kind of snakes are these? Uh, these are the corn, corn snakes. snakes. Yes. Yep. Hmm, cool. What kind of fish is this? They're right here. Paku. Paku? They are a cousin of the piranha. They're hmm. actually vegetarian fish. And they're, you said they're cousins of they're, piranha? Yes, and the piranha are oh, no, I know. Wow. <laughs> Oh, I have a hard time believing that they're a vegetarian. <laughs> and what is in here? Well, uh, uh, the Mata Mata. from South America, around Brazil. Um, he's he's a good representation of being camouflaged. His shell kind of looks like bark, and he's got a his very head's like a leaf. He's got a very yeah, long neck. Yeah, you can neck. see his um, neck. snorkel at the top of his his nose. Uh, he's gonna he going to stick the very arrow? tip of it out to breathe. So now we're here at the gator exhibit, and look what I got. It's a baby gator. 
So, like, is any of this, the, this gators, is any of the mommies in there or no? Uh, no, this one's actually um, from Alligator Adventure in Myrtle Beach. It's a little less I've than... I've been there. Oh, yeah? It's cool. Yeah, it's a little less than a year old. So. And what are, like, what are the alligators in here? Oh, we have three. We have a big male and two females in here. And the male's about 13 feet. I mean, like, what is usually the alligator's diet? Like, anything you can get in its mouth? <laughs> <laughs> well, in the wild, they'll eat turtles, birds, fish. Um, here, they get uh, chickens and rats. <laughs> and what would what would y'all feed this one? Like, insects or something? Uh, he gets little uh, mice pinkies. So this is a cute little guy, but what should I do if I saw one in the wild? Well, you, this one is only used for educational purposes. You don't ever want to approach gators in the wild, um, especially babies. Don't try to catch them. There's usually a mama around, that's for sure. So, um, and, yeah. like, isn't there a way that they call to their mommies? Like, they, like, scream or something? They, they make a little grunting noise. Well, thank you for letting us come out here today. You're welcome. And to all you kids out there that are watching, I know these little guys can be cute and hard to resist, but do not touch them because a mama could be by, and you don't want to end up missing a leg or an arm. Whoa! Wow! Saw you guys really close that time here looking through my telescope. You know, Colby had a great time today out there at Birds of Prey, at the observatory, and at Cypress Gardens. Remember what they told us at the observatory about looking at the sun with your telescope? Yeah, not to do it because you saw what it did to that newspaper, you don't want that to happen to your eye. And don't forget what Colby said about the alligator there at Cypress Gardens. You don't ever want to go and pick one up because, you know, its mama might be close by. You really don't want that to be happening. So, hey, let's look back at our scripture today. Remember, it's found in Psalms 8, verses 3 through 8. All right, so here it is. All right, I look at the heavens you made with your hands. I see the moon, the stars you created, and I wonder, why are people so important to you? Why do you even think about them? Why do you care so much about humans? Why do you even notice them? But you made them almost like gods and crowned them with glory and honor. You put them in charge of everything you made. You put everything under their control. People rule over the sheep and cattle and all the wild animals. They rule over the birds in the sky and the fish that swim in the sea. Wow, that is a really cool scripture. You know, thank you for joining us today on Colby's Corner and getting to join us with all the great adventures that Colby had. You know what? I will see you next time right here on Colby's Corner.